Welcome back to the Institute of Armenian Studies at the University of Southern California. This is our deep dive series that we've called Network Nation. And we began with the premise that sometimes this appears to be more like a crisis nation, going from crisis to crisis. We continued with the concept of knowledge nation, trying to understand all of the crises truly facing uh, the Armenian nation and how to move forward with each or any of them. Our third episode was called Digital Nation, how the digital platforms have, especially in the COVID and the post-war period, changed the way in which diasporan communities interact with each other and with the homeland, Armenia and Artsakh. Every now and then you see a bicycle wheel behind me because our premise has been that this is a relationship that sometimes has a hub in the center and the spokes lead out to the communities in dispersion. And sometimes it's just about the wheel and the communities in dispersion, not always really connected by any spokes to the hub. Our fourth episode last week was called Network Nation. That is trying to go from crisis to network. And we had a series of big thinkers talking about solutions to problems in ways that communities and the government don't. Today's is the fifth episode and the last episode. And today we will focus on communities around the world. That's why we're calling this Global Nation. We'll focus on five communities, Beirut, Buenos Aires, Istanbul, Moscow, and Tbilisi. Why these? Well, because Istanbul, Moscow, and Tbilisi, they are in Turkey, Russia, and Georgia. And geographically, politically, strategically, they're very important actors in the regional conflict, as well as in its aftermath and in potential resolutions for the region and for Armenia and Artsakh specifically. And so Armenians in those countries are impacted by the decisions and the positions of their host governments. Beirut, well, because Beirut has been such an important community, both for the diaspora and for Armenia diaspora relations, and because the people of Lebanon are experiencing two additional crises, collapsed or collapsing economy and government. And so the community's life there is, well, in crisis. And Buenos Aires, well, because communities in the global south are both distant and less heard of and less heard from, so we've included Buenos Aires. And of course, you notice that we left out Los Angeles and Boston and Montreal and Paris, and all of that is for another time. We are going to start with uh, Beirut. Um, and we'll start with Beirut, talk through with the representatives of the communities in the hope that Armenia's High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs is able to connect at some point and join us in this conversation. My colleagues in this conversation, as with the previous episodes, are Dr. Viken Chaterian from the University of Geneva, a political scientist, analyst, journalist, and Shushan Garabedian, Dr. Shushan Garabedian, who is Deputy Director of the Institute of Armenian Studies at USC. So welcome back, Viken and Shushan. Thanks, Alki. Um, we're waiting for Zare to connect, uh, and that's, I guess, the only good thing about that is that it gives each of the two of you a minute to think about and weigh in on the conversations that we're going to have now with the various community representatives. We'll start with Beirut and move on, and each of you will come in with questions, observations, as you wish. So let's start with uh, Beirut, a community that, as I said, has been uh, very important, geographically a fairly concentrated community, intellectual and political center of the Armenian world, arguably, but until Armenia's independence, the country's own politics and economy are in a shambles and the community's institutions are weakened. And on top of that, the blast at the Beirut port in August last year and the war in Kharapag, in Artsakh, the war between Armenia and Azerbaijan, all of that complicated the community's life. This is a community of maybe 50,000. We're going to speak with Gayane Madzunyan, who is a master's candidate in education with a focus on heritage language teaching, which will make Shushan Garabedian very happy. 
the focal point, she is, Gayane Manzunian, is the focal point in Lebanon of the Carlos Gulbengian Foundation and works closely with I mean, uh, the Armenian educational institutions, particularly in Beirut. Gayane, welcome. Hi, Sati. Thank you for having me. With pleasure, and thank you for accepting. Gayane, we've asked you and each of the other guests today really the same questions. How did COVID impact your community? How did the war impact your community? How did perceptions of homeland diaspora relations get impacted? And how did the real relations, how were they impacted? Yes. So as you mentioned, unfortunately, the, the, the pandemic and the war were not the only events that marked the lives of the Lebanese Armenian in the, in the past year and a half. I want to just remind the listeners a little bit about what was going on before the outbreak, outbreak of the pandemic. So in October of 2019, the social uh, upra- uprising started, which demanded the resignation of the prime minister and its government. Um, of course, this was uh, followed with protests, mass protests, and reached uh, the different regions of the country uh, and uh, resulted in road closures, which meant that schools schools, institutions, and businesses were shut down for uh, days and weeks. Uh, After this, in the beginning of 2020, was marked by the gradual devaluation of the local currency, which today reached, uh, lost almost 90% of its value. So people lost access to their money uh, in the banks, uh, not only money in the foreign currencies, but also there were restrictions on on, uh, deposits in the local currency. So when uh, in early March, the first uh, case of COVID was uh, uh, detected, uh, the government was pretty quick in establishing a total lockdown because this was a way for them to keep people out of the streets and away from the protests. I have to be honest and say that our community did a pretty good job in organizing itself in the beginning of the pandemic. So in each neighborhood and region uh, populated by Armenians, uh, the, the, the political parties and the different organizations, they mobilized their resources to help the community fight the virus. For example, the ARF established the emergency COVID committee, the very heavy uh, social media presence with a hotline and the goal was to uh, raise awareness and uh, help people with food boxes and even distributing cleaning supplies uh, to the community members uh, and different other activities. So this was mainly funded by uh, donations from within and outside the country. This was back then when people still in the country were able to donate money to this kind of campaigns. Uh, Of course, the same was done by other organizations such as the AGBU and the Hinchal and Ramgabar parties. Um, The lockdowns uh, because of COVID also uh, let the schools rethink uh, the way they do things. Of course, technology was not a thing largely used in our schools and the the community. And because of the lockdowns, uh, people had to, you know, suddenly do a big shift and and, and, uh, do everything online. This meant not only adopting new practices, but also uh, a new mindset. Things are difficult, but I think the community was doing its best considering its resources. Then, of course, August 4 happened. And the, blast, um, the Beirut port blast. Yes, blast. the Beirut port blast. This uh, damaged, uh, it caused uh, very heavy damages to the Armenian neighborhoods, um, houses of Armenian people, but also to the headquarters of the Astak newspaper, the Zartong newspaper, schools such as the Tekeyan school, the Mesrobian school, the Evangelical Central High School, they were they they were damaged, heavily damaged. Also, Haigazian University was damaged. This meant that a lot of our institutions were physically damaged. And of course, uh, the um, uh, the, the answer to this was not as quick as with the pandemic. So in, the institutions were suffering at this point. Uh, 
but uh, lucky, luckily for the community, there were uh, groups of young people, volunteers that that all of a sudden emerged and they were out in the streets the, the next day of the blast, uh, helping people clean the streets, clean their homes. We even had a, a beautiful initiative by uh, Lebanese Armenian young people called Together for Lebanon. Uh, they 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 collected uh, a lot of donations from abroad and helped not only the Armenians, but also the, the locals and, and Syrian refugees and also Kurds uh, in, the, in these neighborhoods. Uh, neighborhoods. So basically, when the war started, we were all already dealing with a physically, psychologically and financially exhausted community. Uh, however, I don't think this meant that people didn't care about the, the war. On the contrary, people kind of forget about their own problems and focused all their attention and, and, and resources, in the case of people who, who were able to do that, to help Armenia. We know that even People, young men, went to take part in the in the uh, in the war, uh, and and even raising awareness in in Lebanon uh, through TVs, local TVs, and uh, newspapers uh, was was a was a, one of the biggest activities of of uh, the, our institutions during the war. So. Until now, I mentioned a lot of negative things, but I have to be honest and say that these past experiences had also positive outcomes for me, at least. I think the first one is the emergence and the empowerment of the youth. Uh, all of a sudden, our institutions who usually, you know, resist a generation shift, resist the youth, they realize that in order to ensure their survival or, or any kind of visibility, they needed their help. So this is when they came in, the, the young people who understand technology and, and uh, new formats and new platforms. The second was also the, the, the war uh, created the opportunity for um, young scholars, of course, with the knowledge of English, to be part of glo global discussions about the war. And, and this was something new to happen. We, we, we saw the older people listening to these young people because they were professionals in their fields and they were... They, they, they were used to communicate their ideas and, and uh, all this with other people. Mm -hmm. Another positive outcome was, uh, and still in the community, is the enhanced feel, uh, feeling of solidarity. You know, because we are very, we have a collectivist approach and, and it, it is impossible for an Armenian to, to learn that another Armenian is suffering because of not having access to food or not having access to medicine. Unfortunately, the community is in this situation. Uh, so I believe that there is a, lo a lot of solidarity, people helping each other, even if it means lending a hand to people you don't personally know. And another positive outcome for dear to my heart and for the Carlos Gulbenkian Foundation, which is the, the the because of the continuous lockdowns and people having more time on their hands, is the initiatives targeting Western Armenian, which all of a sudden they bloomed on on uh, on different platforms, and it some of them started as just you know, uh, hobbies and just spending some time to, to have fun. And, and at this point, there are some that look like very serious initiatives. And, and of course, this is very important because it helps create a global Western Armenian speaking community that we never had access to before. So of to course, ask, all of this. I'm going to ask Vicky yes, to Sammy. jump in. This is his city. Um, Uh, yes, Gayani, you, you sound full of energy and enthusiasm, but let's face it, Beirut is, is, is falling apart, right? Since uh, October 2019, the economy is frozen. Banks don't give you the money you have in the bank, you have de deposited. So basically, young people are, are deserting Beirut and leaving. Those who can leave, they are leaving. Uh, Beirut once was uh, a kind of a center for the whole di diaspora. Um, still now, you see in many places, in Buenos Aires, in Lisbon, in, in Los Angeles, uh, those people who are active within those communities, they were born, grew up, and were educated in, in Beirut, Lebanon. So what, what, is, 
remaining today from, from the Beirut of the past? And uh, how can the network we are talking about help Beirut in, in the current conditions? Yes, I think it's, uh, we can say that not much of the Beirut of the past is here anymore, even physically, you know, after the, the explosion of August 4. Uh, uh, so, and, and also the community. I, I am enthusiastic because I don't want, I'm the first one to speak and I don't want to sound really, you know, negative in, in my approach. But uh, mm -hmm. yes, it is true. Anyone who can leave the country, uh, Armenians and non-Armenians are doing it. Uh, at this point, education is the first ticket out, you know, people applying for masters, for PhDs outside. It's a w easy way out. And it is understandable. Uh, before the war, Armenia was a main destination. We had a lot of families that left Lebanon for Armenia and settled down uh, there, even in Artsakh. And there are people who are still doing it. It didn't stop. But of course, the war changed the, you know, the flow. Uh, but uh, others are leaving, and I think it's everybody's right to to aim at least for, you know, a decade of a decent life somewhere, anywhere at this point. Um, and um, and uh, we might end up finding representatives of this community in the other communities pretty soon. We just hope that they, they become active members of these communities uh, and, and, and not go and disappear just, you know, thinking of their livelihood or, or, or a piece of bread. And, and, it, and it is fine if they end up becoming active members of other communities, because as you mentioned, um, it is a shame, you know, after all, Lebanon deceives us continuously, but it is our homeland. It is, I believe it is the best homeland Western Armenians ever had. And it is a shame to lose that. And we are losing it, I hope, uh, for better options. Guyana, can you comment on perceptions of diaspora homeland relations, both in terms of COVID, in terms of the situation in Beirut, and of course, uh, the war? Yes, um, I believe that at this stage, with the with the psychological trauma of the community, uh, I think it's really difficult to say that any perceptions are long term. I believe that everything the community now feels uh, temporary uh, concerning Armenia, because you know we don't understand what's happening, what happened in the war, what is happening now, and what is going to happen. So people are just waiting in the in the margin to 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 decide what kind of attitudes they they end up adopting. But I believe that anyone who is who who, who has the capacity at this point to help or to be part of uh, the, everything which is happening is doing it and but for the others who for whom Armenia was mainly a spiritual reference I think the trauma is 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 immense I think um, people are afraid of they are reliving a generational trauma that was never dealt with you know and and losing lands uh, you know the messages that come from especially social media uh, that you know you wake up every day and you don't know if you it's if it's sane to open social media and to see what's happening whom to believe and uh, and 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 what uh, what attitude to adopt in in all of all this chaos Diane thank you um, you've summarized the complicated difficult situation really, really well, very helpful. Um, thank you very much. I think it's really important to understand the situation of all of these various communities. We're going to um, move now to uh, the community of Istanbul and talk about how the war and the situation uh, after the war particularly has impacted that community. Armenians living in Istanbul have always lived on the edge, given the country's unpredictable and unstable politics, especially in the last five, six years. The community is really two communities, tens of thousands of labor migrants from Armenia and tens of thousands of old native Istanbulis, Volsahais. And there are plenty of disagreements and differences within this last group as well. 
Our guest is Robert Koptash, formerly editor of Agos, the newspaper that Hanan Think established. And for the last half decade, he's been editor-in-chief of the Aras Publishing House, and Hanan Think had a hand in the establishment of that as well. Uh, Robert, welcome. Hi, Salpi. Robert, we are eager to hear your answers to the same questions, COVID, the war, both for the community itself, as well as relations or perceptions of relations with Armenia and Artsakh. Uh, yes, Alpi, thank you for inviting me. Uh, this is late at night in Friday. <laughs> uh, maybe we can ask that, is there a committee in Istanbul? Because uh, for I, I know that most of the Armenians from Armenia from, or from diaspora, they, most of the people are forgetting that there is a community, there is a community in Istanbul, uh, in Bolis. Uh, but yes, there is a community uh, in Istanbul, mostly in Turkey, uh, has a population of approximately 50,000 people. Uh, and as you said, we can add to this number about 15,000 immigrant armies from Armenia who came to Turkey for economic reasons, uh, and most of them are without legal papers. Um, although it is not well known in diaspora, or maybe I can say forgotten in diaspora or Armenia, it, it is an organ a, a very well organized structure with traditional in institutions like schools, hospitals, newspapers and foundations. Um, however, it is also has different char characteristics from other diaspora communities. Uh, first of all, this is a community concentrated in a steep, which in which political situation of the country is a very anti-Armenian and Turkish nationalism is, is being traditionally intense where Armenians have lived since ancient times. Uh, the pressure, political pressure, nationalism, Turkish nationalism, state pressure is, uh, plays a very important role in the formation of the identity of the Armenian people in Turkey. Uh, fear, uh, mostly, and trauma, uh, trauma coming from the genocide or maybe if you forget for forget the genocide, the Republican times trauma is very strong in Istanbul Armenian community. Uh, but we are talking about a community that has managed to survive despite all these difficulties. Uh, I think that the two basic dynamics to, that ensure this success are the deeply uh, mm, Bel felt belief that Armenians have the right to live their own land, Istanbul, Turkey, Anatolia, uh, my father's uh, birthplace, Sepastia, Sivas, my mother's Kastamonu, Malatya, uh, all the ancient Armenian land. Uh, and the second, the motivation to preserve their identity and pass it on to the future generations. This is the main basis of the Armenian identity in Turkey. Uh, the Armenians of Turkey have a unique historical, political, and cultural real reality uh, different than all the Ar Armenian diaspora communities. It's, it's a different story in Turkey. Uh, we, live in, we live together with Turks, and unlike diaspora Armenians, when we say homeland, we are not speaking about Armenia, <laughs> uh, but Istanbul or maybe Armenian cities, as I said, in Sivas, Malatya, or Kayseri, uh, or other, where our families immigrated for, to Istanbul. Uh, unlike the diaspora, we don't have political structures. Tashna, Kinchak, Ramgavar, we don't have that. We know that story because uh, it's impossible after the genocide. It creates a significant, significant shortcomings most of the time because politically we cannot express ourselves. But maybe considering the possible 
negativities and conflicts, maybe sometimes it's, it's, it's good. Uh, it, it, it can have some positive effects. Well, the positive effects uh, have been that your other institutions are very yeah, strong. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yes, uh, we can talk about our other social structures, mostly organized uh, uh, around church and schools. Uh, there are 16 Armenian schools in Istanbul. 16 Armenian schools in 16 Istanbul. daily, every elementary. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's open. 3,000 Armenian students, 400 Armenian teachers uh, in Turkey. In Turkey. <laughs> um, Robert, can you, as you're talking about the schools, can you mention how language is used in the schools? Because it's a very unique model. Yeah, unfortunately, uh, our mother tongue, uh, Armenian, is it's it, it's not in a good shape because most of the Armenian families in Istanbul are immigrated from Anatolia, from Sivas, Malatya, in other cities, and our fathers, mothers are were not speaking Armenian, but in Armenian schools, the main language is Armenian, so we can give some, a kind of um, modern tongue ed education to our students. So Armenian is living only in the schools, un unfortunately, but not in the neighborhood as in Armenia or Beirut or, Ale or Aleppo. Uh, but um, at least there is, there is a basis for Armenian in the school. So Turkish curriculum, Turkish education, sy education system, but uh, with an Armenian spirit and with an Armenian language. So uh, How did at that least, work during COVID? Uh, nothing changed. Uh, mm, online education from from mm, what what we say in Zoom? English, I don't know. D distance? So, yeah, yeah. Mo most mostly, yeah. Distance education. Uh, Turkish le lessons in Turkish. Armenian lessons in. Uh, Armen I have a daughter. Uh, yeah, she she speaks Armenian very well, better than me. Uh, my mother tongue is not in, not Armenian, uh, but her mother tongue is Armenian. Uh, they are speaking Armenian, but the main problem is with the COVID. This is a community uh, who lives with uh, living together, mingling together in churches, in schools, in uh, church choirs, uh, in uh, in uh, alumni uh, associations. Alumni associations. So with COVID, uh, th these are impossible. These these are so we cannot come together, and it it creates a very real problem that the, this community dissolves uh, because army is not so strong. Uh, Armenian community is not so strong. So uh, people have to come together, and under the circumstances of COVID. It's impossible. That, but, means, uh, that means that during the war, especially when that cohesion was perhaps more important, it wasn't available. Is that right? Yes. Uh, but there are some new, uh, new spread coming. Uh, for instance, there's a um, new initiative coming from the community uh, called Merhayer, our Armenians. Uh, they are trying to help to need the people, to pre poor people, the the students who are not um, having the possibility to have, let's say, computers, tablets to have uh, to reach the education from uh, distance. Uh, they are helping to each other. So there there is a um, there is there is strong connection in the army community traditionally, uh, but. Uh, COVID uh, circumstances help uh, for the community to reach, to have another, to, to have new approaches to create uh, that solidarity, uh, which is very important for us because uh, we know that uh, in this, in, uh, after the COVID, maybe the life is changing and uh, the community is in different neighbors of the count of Istanbul uh, will not have the possibility to mingle together 
in in an old way, in traditional ways. So we have to find uh, new ways to uh, create solidarity and come together. Vikan, this is a community you know well. One of your books is Open Wounds, Armenia, Turkey, and a Century of Genocide. Armenians, Turkey, and a Century of Genocide. Do you want to jump in? Sure. Robert, nice to see you. It's been a while. Um, Thanks, you. Me, I want, I want to... to <laughs> I want to go back to the 90s when the two institutions where you worked were, were established, Agos and Aras. Those institutions brought a huge change uh, in Armenian life. Uh, I want to mention that um, uh, Istanbul, Boris, Turkey is extremely important for Armenians on two levels. It's important for the Armenian diaspora because we have this uh, heavy history that we need to discuss and, and clarify with, with Turkey, with, uh, with Turkish uh, actors. But it's also very important for Armenia that we saw it last year in the war. So my question to you is that in the 1990s, there was a change. For the first time since the genocide, Armenian intellectuals, thanks to people like Hran Ding, uh, people like yourself, people like your friends, there was a um, dialogue exchange that started between Armenian intellectuals and Turkish intellectuals. Is this over with 2016 or can we hope that uh, down the road some, somewhere we can uh, re continue this dialogue, which is so important to us, to all of us? Uh, thank you, we can. I was very hopeless during the war uh, because, yes, as you mentioned, uh, Turkish intellectuals and ourselves were uh, in a dialogue. Uh, maybe most of the times our Turkish intellectuals were going so far that defending our rights, defend, defending our main cause. Uh, maybe uh, be, because of they were defending their, um, their democracy, Turkish democracy. Uh, they, they were facing their history uh, and Armenian genocide and uh, Armenian issue was a main part of that issue. And uh, what I experienced was during the war, the Karabakh Artsakh war, um, most of the Turkish intellectuals were very silent and it was a very big disappointment for me. Uh, I felt that uh, Turkish nationalism and Turkish nationalist discourse were so uh, so strongful that even for the liberal democratic minded Turkish intellectuals were influenced by that that Armenians were let's say um, aggressive in in Artsakh in Karabakh and they were they didn't regard that as a as a cause as a, as a situation continuation of the genocide. Uh, they neglect the Turkish and Azerbaijani genocidal projects and, uh, and uh, politics. But at least uh, at the end, uh, I have to um, re uh, remember that this is a very dynamic um, society, Turkish society. It's, it's in a big crisis, uh, nationalism very strong, but uh, Leftist, socialist, liberal-minded Turkish people are uh, in search of uh, new narratives of their history. So this is not over. Uh, this is not ended. Mm -hmm. We have to find a way to speak with them. We have to find to explain ourselves. We have to find uh, impact their narrative, even if there are uh, troubles. Uh, there are. Um, uh, there, there are lots of uh, problems. Uh, um, the main problem is for, for the diaspora army communities, even in Beirut, Los Angeles, or other parts, uh, Istanbul creates a unique, uh, in my mind, the, uh, because we are a part of a society in search of democracy. This is the this is a Turkish democratic, this is the story of Turkish democracy. We are a part of it. But for most of the Armenian communities, as far as I know, there is no pluralism, there is no democracy, uh, but Agos, Aras, 
um, but we are searching for is the democracy uh, together with Turks, Kurds, liberal minded people. Uh, this is what we uh, don't have in Armenia or in other diaspora communities. Agos is not a uh, cause of, uh, is not a story of Armenian cause. Aras or other Armenian institutions uh, in Istanbul is not a um, story of Armenian cause. It's a cause of uh, democracy searching people coming together to struggle against oppression. Uh, this is what we need all around the world as people as humans and as Armenians, as I, well, that, uh, as far I as know, I know, know that's where we're going to stop this. You know, sorry, Shush, you know this is where we're going to, because you can't have a better ending line than that. <laughs> and if I've apologized a hundred times during this series, this is my biggest apology because you've packed so much into that last sentence. And finally, you have a tendency to hide pain behind smiles. And your very first sentence when you began the, you know, the, the Istanbul community is not often remembered, uh, is going to be remembered. Uh, thank, thank you, you. Robert Koptash. I know that Shushan intends to do a whole p series of podcasts with you, with Guyane, and so I know our listeners will have another chance to hear you. Thank you again. You're welcome. Um, we have Zare Sinanyan, and so now we will get ready to speak with him. Uh, Armenia, Zare Sinanyan is Armenia's High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs with his own interesting personal trajectory. He was born in Armenia, raised in California where he worked in government, and then went back to Armenia a couple of years ago to take on this position and this responsibility. Zare, I don't know how you did it, but we're glad you connected. Welcome. And he just disconnected. Oops. All right. Well, fortunately, we have a few other communities to talk to, and we'll try to, we'll try to see if we can get Zare back. In that case, let's please move on to Tbilisi. Uh, Tbilisi is really living evidence of the fact that the Caucasus's past was somewhat cohesive as a region. It is, like Baku, a city with a huge, significant Armenian heritage. Many of Tbilisi's mayors were Armenians over the centuries. The face of the city center today are the homes and offices of Tbilisi's old Armenian elite. And when on May 28th, 1918, I haven't forgotten that today is May 28th as well, when in 1918 the Armenian National Council declared Armenian independence, they did so from Tbilisi. So this too is a community that is not really in diaspora, but continues to live where it has for centuries. And George Tumasyan heads the Artsakhank Armenian Community Platform of Georgia, aimed at political and civic participation of the Armenian community of Georgia through dialogue. So I want to welcome George Tumasyan back. He was our guest in our previous series, Armenia uh, After War, Before Peace, and he's our guest here today now. George, welcome back. Hello, Salpi. Thank you for having me. Um, George, you know the questions. Uh, we've asked each of you the same question. Tell us what Tbilisi did with COVID, with the war, and then Shushan has questions for you. Sure. Um, as Georgia's community here uh, in Georgia, Armenian community is very connected to Armenia because we have uh, connection through land, actually. We had different connections during the um, before COVID era, but to, after uh, COVID-19, in fact, Armenia and Georgia are very uh, distanced, in fact, and our community uh, here in Georgia is limited in uh, abilities to be connected to Armenia, to travel to Armenia. Uh, it's more than here, and this is the main factor which shows disconnection between Georgian Armenians and and Armenian, uh, Armenia itself. Uh, it mostly affects uh, Javak very actively because Javak is even much more uh, connected to Armenia on everyday basis. And uh, we have still that disconnection. And in fact, a few days ago, Georgian government declared that they are going to open um, the border 
But the interesting fact is that only citizens of Armenia will be able to travel to Georgia, while citizens of Georgia will be still limited in their uh, ability to travel to Armenia and will need special permission from the government of Georgia to travel to Armenia, where you need to um, submit why you are traveling there, what you are going to do there, and so on. I don't think that this is very much connected to COVID-19, but uh, that, that, that is which is undermining our ability this? to be connected. How do they explain this? Well, uh, they have no explanation for that. We have still some other uh, restrictions in our country, uh, which are not logical and are not connected to pandemic issues. So, yeah, yeah still, still, that's uh, what happening here. Uh, and that, that, that is a main change uh, of uh, COVID because it's limiting our to connected to uh, Armenia and our historical homeland. At the same time, when we speak about post-war -war era, I think war uh, in Artsakh showed the weakness of Armenian community in Georgia, mostly in Tbilisi, because our community in Tbilisi was weak to our support for Artsakh during the war days, to organize political pressure on Georgia, to limit uh, transportation of um, some warfare and soldiers from Turkey to Azerbaijan, uh, and was also limited uh, in ability to push uh, forward the topic of Nagorno-Karabakh settlement in peaceful uh, dimension and at the same time Armenians' right to have their peaceful lives there. But at the same time it also showed that there is no political participation and there is no community structure here in, here in Tbilisi. The issue we, which we had for uh, 30 years since the independence of Georgia was shown up. Our community is represented only one, by one uh, structure, which is actually called Armenian community in Georgia. But uh, I think uh, there is no right to use the terminology when you are representing just one political party, Dashnak Tsutsun. You have no right to call yourself Armenian community of Georgia because it's very diverse our community and uh, unfortunately for me uh, the organization was during the war period was mainly or oriented on criticizing uh, Nikol Pashinyan so, so acting government of, of Armenia 99% uh, of their efforts were actually on criticizing current government of Armenia while actual uh, aim should be, uh, in my opinion, criticizing Azerbaijan because Georgian society uh, is, uh, has lack of information about actions of Azerbaijan, not actions of uh, Armenian government. Maybe they had a lot of wrong steps or some right steps, but that's not what community should do. So I think it showed up that uh, the main issue here in Tiflis uh, is uh, that our communities has po po some political, that community representation has political agenda. And after that, we showed that we, um, we also saw how this political narrative now is very active in Armenia itself. George, so can for I interrupt you? Years, uh Sure. Let me just interrupt you here because in your um, podcast interview with Salty for Afterward Before Peace, I was really struck by you uh, pointing out a strong layer of armenophobia in Georgian society. Can you talk a little bit about where you think this comes from and what's being done about it, both from the Georgian community and uh, from the Armenia end? So that, that's the issue, actually, uh, that Armenophobia is built by Azerbaijan for uh, a, a longer time, 30 years, and uh, Armenian government is not doing anything related to that to work with Georgian counterparts. At the same time, we as a community here, mostly in Tb uh, Tbilisi, we are not able to do that. Look, uh, Armenophobia uh, is also caused by a direct attitude of Georgians to uh, to Dashnak Tutsun. Uh, 
if you ask Georgians, they they know actually that party and they will say that it's the main a enemy of Georgia. And it's very interesting that our community is only represented by that political party and Ge Georgian government is uh, supporting that. It's very supporting interesting. Supporting what? To uh, limit Armenian representation here in Georgia only by just that only political party which is called Armenian of Georgia. So it means that actually no other uh, government, no other community organization was able to become strong enough to community and challenge with Georgians to build, uh, build the bridges between Georgia and Armenia in Georgia and to solve issues of Armenophobia. So they are left only with that only structure. And while uh, from Armenia, we also see that that, that was, was supported during the 30 years. And current Armenian government is not also able to somehow support th that to change. But I can understand that because even uh, Armenian embassy here in Tbilisi is uh, um, in opposition of current government. So that's also the other fact. While Ambassador was appointed uh, during the previous government of Armenia, uh, for some reasons he still is uh, acting ambassador, and he is actually working together with that uh, organization I mentioned already against the uh, interests of Armenian current, current government. So that's the reality we have here in Georgia. George, um, do you think any of this Armenophobia is related to perceptions of Armenians as native Tbilisians versus diasporans, both from within the community, from Georgian perceptions and from the Republic of Armenia perceptions? Is there an attempt to diasporize Georgian Armenians? Or is it a function of the Javakheti separatism mm -hmm. push? But both, both actually. First, uh, they tried to create this uh, enemy type of Armenians, uh, and basically it's coming that Armenians are all are Dashnaks and they are anti-Georgian in some ways. So that that's the narrative. Uh, also, uh, that uh, are in historical way, also in some fake news and so on, Georgian society is attacked by this Armenian by Azerbaijan. Uh, propaganda and at the same time it's uh, also related and uh, uh, we all find some uh, active um, members of that organization I mentioned mentioning Java in wrong way quite oftenly and so that's also causing the attitude of Georgians they are uh, trying to find some uh, 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 issues related to Armenians and they are able to find them if they want. So that's the issue. Viken, last words? Uh, yes, um, ba basically this uh, Armenian-Georgian kind of love and hate goes back to a long time back. It's not just... Uh, the, the, the love is... is I have the, the same question. Together, right? <laughs> no, George and I disagree, but go ahead. <laughs> yeah. Uh, what has been done since, since the, the, the last 30 years so that uh, these kind of stereotypes is not, uh, is not left alone? Is it just a Georgian problem or is it also an Armenian problem? Are, do Armenians also have stereotypes about Georgians? And it stops there, or are we able to confront Georgian stereotypes by creating a dialogue with them, by engaging uh, them? Do you want an honest answer? I believe that uh, KGB is organizing this thing, and the main idea is to push Armenians and Georgians against each other. They are by their controlled organizations, and of course there is also some uh, narrative caused by Armenians in charge and charge, which are influenced by the organization I mentioned, in order to create conflict between Armenians and Georgians, and to, in order to create, to Armenia become an island uh, from all sides uh, surrounded by uh, enemies or by conflicted sides, so Armenia will be fully dependent on the foreign actor, on the Russian 
Russian Federation and their Kremlin's regime uh, to save them. That's it. So the challenge of this region ever becoming a region, it just gets even more complicated. Um, George, we're going to have to say thank you and goodbye to you because I think we have Zare Sinanyan back and I'm going to try not to lose him this time. Third time's a charm, they say. Um, thank you. There are a lot of questions to Zara, actually. <laughs> Well, let's see what we can do about establishing a, a, a way of continuing these conversations. So thank you for your participation, George Tomasian of Tbilisi. And since I have already introduced Zare Sinanian as High Commissioner for Diaspora Affairs, I'm going to welcome him and see if we can quickly get a conversation in. Zare? Uh, now we have a sound problem. Zara, have you muted yourself? No. All right. Um, I promise we will create a, ca a, a platform when we will be able to have a meaningful conversation with Zare Sinanyan and perhaps representatives of some of these other communities. Let's let this post-COVID experience of ours in connecting distant places do its thing. Um, so I'm going to move on to Moscow. And this is a community that is, again, one of those that in the West, at least, the diaspora doesn't much speak about. Moscow is the capital of the Russian Federation, was the capital of the Soviet Union and the Russian Empire, and Armenians lived or live in each of those political entities, and so Moscow too has many citizens of Armenian origin, as well as a new diaspora from the Republic of Armenia that altogether number maybe half a million, but in Russia there are more close to two to three million Armenians. We're going to speak with Arman Sahagyan, who is a businessman, a co-founder of a new organization called 5165, which is on Facebook if you want to check them out. Why 5165, you say? Because that's the height of Mount Ararat. Arman Sahagyan, welcome and thank you for joining us. Hello, Salfi. Um, Arman, you know the questions. What did COVID do to the Moscow community and what did it do to relationships with Armenia and perceptions of relationships with Armenia? Salpi, uh, actually, I, I've forgotten about the COVID uh, because of this uh, uh, recent uh, uh, war in Armenia and uh, this issue with the war, it became the main thing which, which we are thinking about. Uh, to be honest, uh, it's not, it's not such a big problem uh, with the COVID in Russia because there are not so many restrictions actually. Uh, I don't know whether somebody, some of uh, some of you visited Moscow, but uh, it's pretty open and you don't have any 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 big restrictions. So the restaurants are open and the, okay. the social places. So the war. Um, yes. Uh, do you want me to speak about the reaction of uh, Moscow or Russian uh, diaspora towards the war? The war and also how did it change relations with Armenia? If before it was really familial relations, you sent money to your family, to your village, uh, you visited, um, what changed? Were there structures that came about? Uh, was the attitude towards how to engage with Armenia changed? Did anything change? Okay, I would like to, I would like to uh, represent myself and uh, to tell a little bit about the Russian structure of Armenian uh, communities. So, in Russia, we have a couple of organizations which are um, which are mainly uh, organizing the Armenians in Russia. This one of them is this Society of Armenians of Russia, which is uh, headed by Ara Abramia. Um, there are a couple of other uh, organizations, but uh, to my opinion, uh, um, they haven't succeeded for the recent 30, 30 years. They couldn't form uh, power in terms of um, uh, to form the organization which have some influence in Russia. Mm -hmm. 
actually there are many Armenians in Russia and uh, uh, each one, I mean uh, person by person, we have a very influencer, very influential Armenians in Russia. But unfortunately there is no, uh, there is no agenda for, uh, for the Armenian diaspora in Russia. Everybody is trying to help Armenia in its own way. Somebody is uh, individually right. Somebody is uh, building a church and putting his name on the church. Another one, uh, I don't know, is uh, building a school. Another one is uh, doing something else. But there is no uh, there is no um, agenda which is na nation uh, which, which is forwarded to the nation. Uh, which will be more resultive. Uh, I don't know whether you... Did the you war know, change or, that? Uh, I would tell what, uh, what we were doing du during the war. We were actively supplying our army because the Russian government gave the possibility to transfer this uh, dif difficult uh, double, um, um, double meaning uh, things to, to, to the army. I mean that night vision, thermal vision, uh, and other stuff for the army and we were supplying the army um, and a lot of people uh, like uh, became uh, individual suppliers supply, suppliers of an Armenian army during the war and uh, uh, while this war going on many people got to know each other and uh, when the war ended uh, our group uh, and a couple of other groups we sat together on 9th uh, of November and we were thinking what we are doing for the recent 10 years uh, because our generation, I'm 35 years old and my friends were nearly the same age uh, we thought that we did a lot of charity to Armenia and we uh, tried to be uh, in help to our army but with uh, one signature of, uh, of, of, of one uh, very valuable person, uh, everything, everything went to the enemy. So our hope, our lens, our best, uh, best generation, best, best men, best uh, soldiers, they died. And we decided, we thought that uh, the, the charity and uh, what we do is uh, um, mainly gives us some, I don't know, some uh, Make we think that we are doing a good job. Yes, we uh, we feel ourselves. Uh, you feel good. I don't know. Satisfied. Uh, yeah, we feel good actually. Yes, and we, if we don't know, we do it because we feel good, mostly, or we do it because we do it for Armenia. This is a big question, to be honest, because you know when you do charity, it's it's a big pleasure when they say hello. Hey, when they say. Uh, How did you answer you. your question? So we've decided that uh, Armenia has a big problem, and this problem comes 30 years old. 30 years, uh, this problem is uh, is uh, on air. This is that the Armenia doesn't have national uh, and patriotic government. This is the the main problem. And how do we, we solve have. that? So uh, I don't want to say that we are solve uh, we, we we want to solve it, but we are we want to try to solve it. So we decided that if we can supply the army, if we can build uh, churches, we can uh, build uh, uh, schools and kindergartens, and uh, to introduce programs to the government that we, they decline all the time, then maybe uh, people like us should. Um, um, should betray the uh, zone of comfort and uh, try to go into the politics. And uh, in our belief uh, that uh, it's nearly impossible to make Armenia powerful and make our Armenia wealthy country until the people from diaspora will not have ability, will not have chance, and uh, will not have legal um, legal basis to become a part of Armenian government. And, and as you, when you say we, you're talking about Armenian citizens who are living in Moscow. You know, I have double citizenship. And uh, there are a lot of uh, Armenians here who have double citizenship. By means of law, it's, it's okay. So uh, when I'm talking about us, this is the generation which, were, which moved 
to uh, to Russia in the beginning of 90s and we got our education here in Russia and uh, uh, we were we had uh, quite a lot of resources and uh, ability and possibility to help Armenia because Russia give uh, possibility to earn money in the end of the day and you know that uh, uh, the wealth of Russian Armenians is very very high and uh, it's not only Samuel Karapetian or uh, Ruben Vardanian who has big wealth there are many Armenians which we don't know them here in Russia which are in power and uh, they are quite wealthy Vikan do you want uh, to jump in? Sure of course me I want to take the debate uh, away from Moscow bringing patriotic government to Armenia but back to Moscow Armenian thinking about the Armenian diaspora in Russia uh, you said about the financial potential we know that there's a huge community in Russia in Moscow in northern Caucasus uh, Armavir uh, Rostov uh, Siberia and so on my question is uh, we have a problem of or organizing this community the Russian Armenians. Uh, is it because of the Russian system, which is a very top-down system from the days of uh, the Tsarist Empire to the Soviet Union to, to today, while diasporas are basically grassroots communities? Is, is this the problem? Or do you have a huge margin in Russia which is not exploited? If it is the case, why? Especially since you remember when we talked offline, you were talking about how easy it is to assimilate, to really disappear into the fabric of Russian society. But is it even perceived as assimilation? Let's, let's uh, include that in the response, right? You know, I want to return to the first uh, sentence of Vikel when he said that we are bringing patriotic government from Moscow to Armenia. Uh, I would uh, like to ask uh, everybody and to, to tell that if uh, Armenians from uh, Russia go to Armenia and try to do something, it's not because the Russian gov government or Russian KGB asked them to do that. Uh, so I'd like to say that there are many, many that. patriotic... I don't think that was a subtext there at all. But, no, no, but okay, we, I accept, so. we accept I hope the so, statement. Anyway, yes, but I wanted to tell that uh, because sure. I, I, I thought that you are uh, telling sure. about this. In terms of uh, organizing the diaspora here, uh, I don't think that the Russian government is a problem uh, for Armenians and they are the reason why Armenians cannot uh, get together. It's the uh, problem of egocentrism. I don't know if I'm telling this word in, uh, in English right or not. So I mean uh, that every rich Armenian or powerful Armenian wants to create his own organization of oh, feudalism and uh, yes and uh, there are uh, organizations in in the, in those re regions which you talked about Rostov I don't know the south of Russia uh, and the uh, Urals so on but uh, I want also to tell you that there is no national agenda uh, so there is no national uh, idea why they should get together we get together only one day in the, in the year, 24th of April. That's it. This is the only national agenda which Armenians have now. But this is tragic agenda. So the main issue of uh, gathering Armenians together is the national ideology, which, which we don't, do not have. Uh, in my opinion, Jew people uh, in the end of uh, 19th century, they could uh, arrange a national agenda that they want to create a powerful uh, Jewish state. And uh, as we know, Th Theodor Herzl, Herzl wrote uh, a book which is uh, less than 100 pages. And in this, he pr provided the national agenda. And this is the main issue, I think, that the Armenian nation should uh, understand. Uh, what is, is there the national discussion about a vision for Armenia? in these new circles that you said came about as a result of the war? Is uh, that you know, topic? Uh, you know, this uh, which we, you mentioned, I, want, I don't want uh, this discussion to turn to the political, uh, to the political field, uh, but I want to tell a little bit about our group, which is named 5165, 
we started with forming an uh, ideology. So uh, why we gather together, why we need Armenia, and uh, what is the national interest of Armenia. And we formed in six uh, pages uh, document. Uh, if, if it's interesting, I can send you to some to send it to Salpi and you can and we'll get the include it in the description of this video, yeah. yes, of course. Uh, one of the main uh, points uh, that we want to uh, to live in the land, in this land, uh, which is 29,000 square kilometers now, uh, with Karabakh it was plus 12,000, and to be able to live on this land, we need a strong army, uh, which will protect us, and um, uh, so we want the strong, militarized Armenian state. Uh, I understand that uh, uh, it might sound not so good, militarized Armenian state, but actually we don't have another uh, option. We have to um, spend our money, uh, to spend our resources, and to bring our people to go to the army service, even women, uh, to be able to, to protect ourselves. So, Arman, I'm going to, I'm going to thank you um, and stop here because we still need to get Buenos Aires in before this program ends. But I do uh, welcome any links and documents that can be posted because, um, as you said or I said at the beginning, the Moscow community is not often part of this broader diaspora conversation, and it really hmm. must be. Uh, thank so. You. Thank you for your participation and thank you for continuing to supply information to make this conversation happen. And thank we you. are going to move on to Buenos Aires, which is really a community of genocide survivors with a disproportionate presence in Argentina and in Armenia. Their numbers are around 100,000, mostly in Buenos Aires. And Dr. Khachik de Rugasian is very active in that community. He's a political analyst with a PhD from the University of Miami in International Studies. Khachik de Rugasian, welcome. Thank you, Salpi. Hi, everyone. Um, after the attempt with Zare, I'm just afraid that other things aren't going to work. I'm glad you're there. Um, Khachik, you know the questions. What did the community do? What did, how did COVID impact the community as such? And the war, of course, both relations with the homeland and perceptions of relations with the homeland. Okay, we, we, we are not in the post-COVID stage yet. Uh, actually, the second wave is hitting very hard, the region and uh, Argentina in particular. Uh, that seems closer. I mean, a lot of people that we know around us are dying, literally. Uh, at a time when vaccines are here, I mean, they are coming. It's, it's, it's late, but they are coming. And for the next maybe three or four months, vaccination will be, you know, uh, speeded up. But meanwhile, it's, it's very difficult. So uh, we are not in the post-COVID-19 uh, stage yet. But um, we, we can see the post-COVID stage. It's uh, the social and economic situation of Argentina will be very hard, very tough, and it will hit also the, the community institutions. So during the first wave, I mean, the first two or three months, where the, the country was relatively speaking to other countries, compared to other countries in the region was, was pretty well organized. I mean, the, the, the government moved fast. Uh, the community also was organized. You know, we, we have a forum of uh, institutions uh, called Diara, and it's, uh, uh, you know, Spanish uh, first letters. But, um, and, and we, we started thinking about what to do in the post-COVID precisely and uh, how to help the institutions, how to get, you know, see a light at the end of the tunnel. It was not was easy, but established. We... That organization existed. So when the war happened, you were able to transition? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. That organization, I mean, uh, to, to some extent, all the institutions were together, at least for the last, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 years uh, for special occasions, you know. But uh, this... Uh, took a more institutionalized uh, path, if you want, starting from 217 January of 
207. This is not a community representation. And by the way, I, I, I don't have any mandate to speak about uh, 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 in representation of the community. I'm, I'm talking as as a right. So talk but about yes, the afterwar yes, situation. So during the war, the, the community was really mobilized. I mean, with the outreach to uh, political politicians, uh, media, uh, rallies in the midst of the COVID-19 was, was really very satisfying. And the most positive aspect of it is that immigrants from Armenia uh, got connected with the community and they integrated with the community. Now, this is a very, very positive experience for, for us. Unfortunately, the trauma of the defeat and the humiliating surrender was very strong, it very strong. We, we were mobilized and for the next four months it was paralysis. I mean, literally paralyzed, but the, the community was paralyzed. We didn't know what to do. Of course, the, 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 the political crisis in Armenia, ongoing political crisis in Armenia did not help. But also it was, you know, summertime in, in the south. Um, the COVID-19 cases were down, really down. So everybody wanted, you know, to seize the opportunity for some vacations or something. But uh, it was um, it was bad. In the fall, in March, we came back. We we started to think, but it is very confused. I mean, definitely something has changed, but we don't know what. We don't know, and we, we are not rationalizing what what has changed. Uh, the, what changed the world? We have grassroots com, uh, connection with, with Armenia, and especially with with Artsakh. But uh, I'm sorry to say this: we are very, very deceived with the official connection with uh, with what you call the state of, of Armenia. We, we we don't feel that there is any interest, um, except maybe for individuals or uh, some aspects. But uh, we don't see any knowledge or interest. For, for the community, but that's okay. That's okay. We think that uh, we should move forward. Uh, and, um, uh, it, I was reading an Armenian Mirror Spectator article from June 2020 about how the Buenos Aires community is handling um, COVID. And there is a quote that struck with me. I want to read it for you and maybe you can comment. One of the community represent, representatives said, we're trying to strengthen Armenia, but our diaspora communities need to be strong too. So this tension between communities serving their own needs while also having the state to worry about. So the question is, who is whose champion? And, and is that a tension? Well, definitely, you know, this, this is not only the world. The world speeded up this this thinking. I had this thinking for for a while now. Um, the, the, there was a di diaspora awareness in the late '60s, '70s, and '80s. Something really got wrong after the independence, and and I'm not I'm not saying that Armenia is is guilty about that, but we didn't know how to move from the 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 the, the state of play of diaspora in before the independence and after the independence. So I think that now we should go back to that diaspora awareness from a nation in exile to a network nation. And uh, when diaspora uh, starts to think about diaspora, when we modernize our tools of development of the Western Armenian identity, which is an identity, uh, I think that we can be ready for a word I will use, and you are very familiar with it. Um, yeah. Those uh, are but first, we need to think about diaspora as diaspora. Vika? Uh, yes, Khachig, you, um, you are part of this network, born in Lebanon, now uh, working in Buenos Aires. Like many of us, we, we were born in Beirut or in other Middle Eastern uh, cities, and we provided the intelligentsia, the party caters, the cultural uh, personalities for the diaspora. Where are the, the Middle East is not the same anymore, right? Uh, we just heard about Beirut. Where are we producing uh, the diaspora intelligentsia today? Uh, you know, we can. That's not the case in South America. 
I probably I'm the last one who immigrated from from Lebanon in, in Argentina. We have Armenians who came in from Armenia in the 1990s, and recently we are knowing how. how I mean, there are probably 9,000 or 15,000 Armenians from from Armenia, which which is important, but we knew very few of them. So I I wouldn't say that there is an input in South America in the development of the profile of the South American diaspora from the Middle East. I don't know what is my input, really. I, I don't know. I work as the editor of, of the Aliyah I don't know, and I don't want to talk about that. But this is the fourth and fifth generation born and raised in South America who are uh, thinking about themselves as Armenian Argentines, Armenians, Ar Argentines, whatever you want, but they are engaging somehow. So you can see the change, you can see the change, but we don't rationalize yet, we don't theorize yet the, 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 this change as, as part of a, you know, diaspora movement. That's and we, we are far away from Armenia in the center. We are the periphery, but, um, you know, uh, in a global world that, that can be really very, very uh, much changed. Yeah, we're not theorizing these changes, as you said. Um, Dr. Khachik Derugasian, thank you. This is a community, again, worth continuing to speak with and about. And so that is the last of our five communities that we wanted to speak with and about in this program. We're going to end by inviting a, a friend, a special guest, Dr. Razmik Panosian, who is the author of a book called The Armenians, From Kings and Priests to Merchants and Commissars. He's a political scientist who, since 2014, has been director of the Armenian Communities Department of the Kalust Gulbengian Foundation, which is a conversation in itself. After all, the foundation and Razmig are based in Lisbon, uh, but that's for another day. Part of Dr. Panosian's job is to interact with diaspora communities and support innovative programming and essential programming, and sometimes those two are the same. Uh, nevertheless, he's perfectly positioned to help us conclude this series. Razmik Panosian, welcome. Thank you, Salpi. Thank you. Uh, nice to be with you. Uh, Razmik, you're here among friends, so we can take these last 13, 14 minutes that we have of this series any way you want. Is there anything you want to comment on based on what you've heard? Or do you really want to talk really about the same mm -hmm. questions we've asked everybody else and how what you've gleaned over this last eight months since the war? Um, well, there are some things that I observed because I watched all the episodes prior to this and the fascinating discussion today. Um, there are, how to structure my comments? I would say that I would point about to three assumptions and uh, put one question forward. Uh, three assumptions based on the conversation so far, the, the, the five episodes. Uh, and then at any point, interrupt me if I speak too long. Uh, oh, we do that well, know. don't worry. <laughs> yeah. Well, uh, uh, the one assumption, the, an undercurrent assumption, is that connectivity or networks uh, is some sort of a solution. And I would say that it's not a solution. Uh, it is a means. A network is a means. And, you know, there are bad networks too. There are criminal networks or uh, benign networks uh, and uh, whatnot. Uh, but it's the content that matters, the content of the network. And here we're coming back to square one, the visioning exercise. Uh, the visioning exercise of what is the network about. And, and today, in today's discussion, we saw an excellent example of that. When Robert Koptash spoke of... Um, you know, intellectuals in Turkey looking to new narratives to construct a democratic society and Armenians are part of this. This has its own network. This would have its own network. This would be part of a discussion. And contrast that to what Armin Sahagian from Moscow said about a national ideology in a militarized Armenian uh, nation, which would have its own network. And these two networks would not necessarily interact. So I think the first thing we should say is, when we're talking about network nation, we should be saying, what are these networks about? And then we have to make a, 
a judgment call, a political decision, a preference decision, which network we want to be part of and which network we want to bring to its conclusion. And Hampak Kapketsian spoke about that. Which networks do you want exactly. to be a part of? What are the exactly. content of networks? Yes. And what do you get uh, out of them? The, he was mostly talking about technological stuff uh, from what I gathered, but the, the wider point is well taken because we have a choice to be in whichever network we can be. We can be in one or two or three networks, obviously, but there is an ideological commitment of some sort when you're part of a network. Uh, so that's the first assumption. The second assumption, um, it's always there whenever we talk about Armenia diaspora and, and the idea of the wheel, that the, the, the metaphor of the wheel, that uh, somehow the diaspora will be helping or should be helping Armenia if we find the right key, if we find the right people. And here, I think we're making a series of assumptions about the capacity of the diaspora, the interest of the diaspora, the ongoing engagement uh, of the diaspora, and the lack of self-interest of the diaspora. I, I think in the conversation today that also came up just now, a few minutes ago, where diaspora institutions, diaspora leaders, do not necessarily want to dismantle their communities in order to go to Armenia or to uh, necessarily help our, our, help Armenia at all expense. So I think we have to, in some ways, we are putting too much emphasis on diaspora as a savior. And here, you know, my, my thinking is that the Armenian government should think what a small state that is relatively powerless at this point, what a small state should do to get out of this mess on its own. Forget the diaspora. And then once you have that vision, once you have that way of thinking, then think about what is it in the diaspora that I could use to do this and not start with the diaspora, not start, well, if the diaspora should come and be one big network and help us, you know, 30 years have shown that, yeah, it's both sides, but the diaspora hasn't necessarily always risen to the occasion. So that, that I would say that's a second assumption. Um, and the third assumption is a provocative one. Um, which comes from Sebu, Professor Sebus Aslanian's uh, historical um, narrative. And we always look at the, the trade network as this wonderful trade network, as this wonderful golden era of Armenian history in some Don't ways. Don't burst my bubble. No, I'm not. It, it was. But there are two things, two things that we're not taking into account. It was a golden period in Armenian history because we did not have a political center. And when we interacted very closely with the Odars, we were not insular, right? So we are looking as this wonderful historical example when there was no state. It was the diaspora. It was the trade network. There was no political hub. There was a religious hub for sure. There were actually several religious hubs. There was a Catholic and the and the Gregorian, but there was a religious hub, uh, but not a political one. So those are the three assumptions I think that were underlying in, in the discussions. Um, and the fourth uh, thing point I would make, the, the fourth question, it's question, and it comes directly from the earlier conversation, who is going to think for the diaspora? In 1988, we part our thinking capacity, when I say our, the diaspora's thinking capacity, we part the diaspora's thinking capacity in Yerevan. And there is no one left in the diaspora, with the exception of a very small group of, they tend to be French intellectuals, but they're a small group of intellectuals uh, who are thinking for the diaspora. And I think we need to think ahead when we're thinking ahead in, uh, in this visioning exercise, how can we enhance the diaspora its capacity to think, because at the end of the day, uh, our network nation is really the diaspora's network, and the diaspora has to be able to think for itself, which it did until 1988, 1989, 1990. And after that, everything became Yerevan at the expense of the diasporas thinking about their own future, which they had done for the previous, since the genocide. Right. So those were some of the uh, comments that I would make. And Provocative I'll is the word you, you used, and, and I'll buy it. There's so much to agree with and disagree with. Viken Shushan, who wants to jump? Or, or, or add disagree. two. Or <laughs> add two. 
Vikan, you've been taking notes. You want to go, Shushan? Y yes, uh, Razmig, your second point. You said uh, maybe Armenia needs to have a vision first and then to create alliances with different elements of the diaspora f to realize that vision. What about the diaspora? I mean, do, do we I, also need to have a vision first that's... and then to say... Yeah, Sorry? I did not say Armenia needs to create a vision. I said we need to create a vision in the broadest sense of the we. I did not, I would not say Armenia needs to create the vision. And that's why I ended on the last point that the diaspora needs to think. And part of the thinking is to create a vision, right? For, for itself and okay. for, the, for the nation. Sorry, yeah. So, so can, 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 you, can you give us some hints from, from your perspective, from, from the, the angle of Lisbon? What could this be? Oh, well, you want the answers now, not just the questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Shushan, do you well, have actually, more questions before we ask Razmik for answers? I, I do, actually, but I, uh, Razmik, this may be an unfair question to ask, and if you say it's unfair and don't want to answer, don't answer. But I just read something today and I thought of you. Um, the Vietnamese-American writer Viet Thanh Nguyen uh, was teaching a class this semester at USC where students interviewed American and Vietnamese survivors of the Vietnam War. And the entire task was to study how all wars are fought twice. First time on the battlefield, second time in memory. And I kept thinking throughout this entire discussion, how will the 2020 Artsakh war be fought in the collective diaspora memory? And I kept going back to your book, which I used in my Armenian heritage class to talk about these narratives, right? These grand narratives. So my question and my kind of internal dialogue with you was how will Razmik fit this experience into the grand narrative unfair question too big of a question well, just he has three whole minutes there. to answer so he should exactly <laughs> he's got two questions three minutes we're doing well if i give a long answer to shushan i can avoid weekend's question uh, but no. I, 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 give, I give one and a half minutes each um uh, shushan it's it's funny you say that because uh about three weeks ago, four weeks ago, I moderated a roundtable at the Association for the Study of Nationalities uh, with uh, four, uh, four experts. And I ended on that question. How is this war going to be remembered? Uh, and it was not just Armenians, of course. And the, ov the overarching feeling was that it's going to be remembered um, as a other defeat. Uh, now, of course, if we look at how the defeat in 1920 was uh, interpreted, uh, the historians are going to say, "Well, we could have won if Russia had uh, if Russia hadn't stayed so neutral, if Turkey hadn't intervened." But I think in the grand narrative of Armenian history, it is going to be remembered as a major turning point and as a major defeat, where some lessons learned from some people is going to be a militarized nation, and for others it's going to be, uh, you know, there is no future in trying to fight another war. And I think these two narratives will fight each other uh, uh, in the next uh, 10, 20 years. Also, a lot happens. What hap uh, a lot depends. What happens in four and a half years uh, with the Russian troops? The weekend's uh, question: What is the next step? Um, you know, the, the step is for diasporans themselves to create these spaces. You know, I don't want to let the cat out of the bag, but the Gulbenkian Foundation is thinking about this kind of institution, a uh, think tank of sorts. Uh, but we're too soon to announce anything of this sort. But. We need to have those spaces. We need to have the spaces where diaspora intellectuals come together, sometimes in dialogue with Armenia, sometimes on their own, where they say, where are we going as a people? Where are we going? We're not going to disappear. We're going to stay here. Uh, and uh, just to be even more provocative, Salpi, I mean, I have written about four or five years ago, uh, an article where I say, I can guarantee you 50 years down the road, there's going to be an Armenian diaspora and they're going to shout and scream and they're going to mobilize. We might not recognize them. They might not speak Armenian, but there will be. I cannot guarantee 50 years down the road, there's going to be an independent Armenian state. I hope I'm wrong. I, I really hope I'm wrong. But we need to be realistic about these things and, and 
uh, and the diaspora should assume the responsibility, intellectuals, leaders should assume the responsibility to think for themselves, to act for themselves. Of course, always hopefully coordinating it uh, with Yerevan, with Armenia. And, and so that's, that's how I see this dynamic developing. To come back to the metaphor of the bicycle, Sapi, you know, unless you're a clown and you're using a unicycle, a bicycle has two wheels and you have to move in order for that bicycle to stay upright. Uh, and, you know, those two wheels in our case, one is the diaspora, one is uh, Armenia, the homeland, and they're intimately connected uh, and they should remain connected, coordinated, but they're two separate units. And, and that's sort of my uh, approach uh, to this sort of network nation uh, discussion, the, the fascinating discussion that has taken place. And, and the final thing I would say is, you know, uh, connectivity is important, but connectivity without actual commitment and action is meaningless. So let's not get carried away just with connectivity. Let's also okay. always, always bring it back to action and uh, meaningful uh, uh, commitment and uh, meaningful action. Thank you, Razmig. In fact, that's one of the places we started because that was a question that came up in one of our conversations with Khachik Tolulian, that, you know, does connectivity necessarily mean outcomes? Um, as always, your contribution is very interesting and valuable, and thank you very much for participating in this last episode. Thank you to Shushan Garabedian, who I work with every day, whose podcasts, by the way, you can hear, Language Therapy with Dr. K. And to Viken Chetarian, who is a wonderful partner in this and other projects and who has several recent pieces uh, we will link to, including a piece called Post-War Messages from Azerbaijan, a critical reading that is definitely worth looking at. And he also writes about once a month for the August newspaper in Istanbul. So thank you, Shushan. Thank you, Viken. I, um, your last provocative questions are going to have to do because we are completely out of time. And one of these days we will all get together and think about what our next mission is because the Institute now will stop here. And our mission is to study and support the study of contemporary Armenian studies. So as such, I suppose we will wait for the conclusion of elections in Armenia and continue to ask questions about what is happening in the diaspora, engage our work going forward, hopefully with you, Viken, still, with you, Shushan, of course. Thank you both. Thanks, Salpi. And Thanks thank you lot, all for Salpi following. Thanks a lot, and everyone for, for this, for this occasion and dialogue. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Thank you all for watching and following. Uh, this has been an effort really to try to, I think it was Khachik Dergogasian who said we haven't yet rationalized or theorized in fact what is happening, but it's a beginning in that process. We will continue to do this through the audio podcasts that we do regularly, language studies with Dr. K that Shushan Garabedian uh, conducts. I will continue with unpacking Armenian studies. We hope you will watch and share these uh, contentful products and use them as basis for both uh, gaining knowledge, but also asking questions. Thank you for following us at the University of Southern California Institute of Armenian Studies.